there's two ways when it comes to this freedom of speech, right? The idea of being able to say the message that you want to say, and that becomes the art itself. But then what about when creatives actually want to use their art as a tool to protest, mm -hmm. right? When, when they specifically and intentionally say, I'm going to write this song. There were many songs released last weekend, yes. right? Mm -hmm. There were many poems released last weekend. And I'm sure that somebody somewhere has filmed and is creating a documentary right now because we have museums that have put out the call for the signs that were used in Saturday's Women's March, looking at it as historical artifacts, right? And there were a lot of artists who put a lot of thought and care into some of those signs, you know, and Susan and I were talking about with some of our favorites that we saw in the march, because some of them were very clever. Um, but artists, visual artists, really got behind the march in the way that they could. What's their skill? Art, that representation. The musicians got behind it. What's their skill? Writing the songs. The filmmakers got there. And there's been lots of little videos going out, you know. It's how you use your skill. And how do we make sure that, that we're protected in using those skills? We had um, four journalists that were actually arrested at Friday's protest and they're being brought up on felony charges. Mm -hmm. Now, if you remember on Friday, there was, you know, people were burning cars and breaking windows, mm -hmm. and these reporters were there doing their job reporting, and they were swept up with all the other protesters, and now they're facing felony charges. You know. Are the charges like disturbing the peace? Or Inciting a riot. Mm -hmm. Right? And they were trying to say, hey, we're just here covering the news. We're not part of it. But where do those lines get drawn? Right? So what I want to start with, I gave everybody a handout. I actually put in the First Amendment. Because sometimes, a lot of times, we talk about things, but we don't know all of the technicalities. Right? And so I thought it would be good if we just had it in front of us and see what it is that it actually says. And, you know, it talks about... Congress, and one of the things to keep in mind is that the Constitution is the top law of the U.S. <coughs> There's nothing above the Constitution, okay? Um, regardless of what certain people may think, <laughs> <laughs> we do have a checks and balances system uh, in the country between the three legislative branches, and when it comes to the Supreme Court, they always look back to the Constitution, okay? And when we read this, we see it's got a number of rights that it guarantees us. And the first one is the establishment of religion. And one thing that I want to say about these rights, what's really interesting is that sometimes people say, well, that right can't protect that. That doesn't make any sense. And whenever I see the, this one about the establishment of religion, I remember the case of the Pastafarians. Have you heard of the Pastafarians? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Now this case came up because somebody went to take their driver's license picture and they had a colander on their head. And they wanted their picture with the colander. And the person said, no, we cannot take a picture of you with the colander. And he says, well, it's part of my religion. I'm a Pastafarian and we wear the colanders on our head. And it went all through the court system, and it was determined that Pastafarianism is an established religion. <laughs> and they won the right to have that picture with the colander on their head. Now, some people may say, oh, that's ridiculous. That's just a stunt. That's just a thing. But I think it shows, right, that when we talk about some of these rights, we're still divided even though we have the language. Because we don't always understand that's a Pastafarian, right? But what right does the court have to say Pastafarian's not a religion, Christianity's not a religion, Muslims are not a religion, mm -hmm. you know, and we're facing that with a possible registry. You know, is that going to be affected or is the Constitution going to be able to hold up to that? Okay, so just an example of how, you know, it may come up. Um, 
abridging the freedom of speech. And I think for a lot of people, you know, they're always saying, I can say whatever I want to say. I'm American, right? <laughs> I'm in the US. This is my right. And some people even think that the whole First Amendment is just this one right, right? It becomes synonymous. First Amendment, freedom of speech becomes synonymous. Um, but freedom of speech is not absolute. Uh, there are laws that say that we cannot just say whatever we want. And I think a good example, if you don't mind me using it. Yeah, go ahead. But, you know, when you came and, and showed us this telemarketing and we heard the telemarketer coming up and trying to hit on you as you're telling them, get me off this line, does he have a right to say those things, right? Obviously, harassment is not allowable. However, the law defines harassment that it has to be repetitive. So one phone call wouldn't fall under harassment, unfortunately. It's just annoying, right? But the other thing is, is that that telemarketer, what he's doing is what we call commercial speech. And commercial speech, unlike us talking or being at the protest or saying what we say here, can be restricted in ways that just regular speech cannot. Okay, so businesses cannot say everything that they want to say, right? So, for example, the, the Federal Trade Commission says that businesses, when they do an ad, have to be truthful, right? They have to say the truth in their ad. So, you know, these pharmaceutical companies have to be careful what they claim. And we've seen quite a few pharmaceutical companies get zinged on making claims that are not true. Well, that's one thing, the commercial speech aspect. But the second thing that we're not allowed to do is we're not allowed to incite riots. Okay, you can't say, hey, everybody go. And, and this example is Madonna, unfortunately, got in trouble this weekend. She gave a fiery speech and let's drop bombs on the White House. <laughs> and, you know, of course, then Newt Gingrich comes out and says, she needs to be investigated. She needs to be arrested. This is, you know, inciting a riot. And, and she came back and said, what? We're talking about love bombs. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to love bomb the White House. You know, we're not going to do that. <laughs> um, and, and so she's sticking to that now. But actually, we have some radio stations that have now stopped playing Madonna, saying that because of what she did, that she's not, you know, she's not welcome on the radio station because their audiences don't want to hear that. And I don't know if you guys remember, but this actually happened to the Dixie Chicks mm -hmm. during the Bush presidency. And they took a big hit, right? Even though that was said outside of the US. I mean, Madonna said it right at the White House. <laughs> Gutsy, right? Um, but remember, it's love bombs. <laughs> uh, but you know, the, the other thing that we have to realize is that what we say can have consequences to our work and to our career. And that has really been proven through social media, hasn't it? Yeah. Right? So, you know, a, a lot of times I say, you know, if your gut says don't post it, don't hit that, you know, post button, don't do it. <laughs> because... Just type it if it makes you feel better. And delete it. <laughs> delete it. <laughs> delete it. <laughs> better type it separately Facebook, right? <laughs> don't type it into Facebook because there's always that error mistake you might just hit it anyway you know but we really have to be careful about what we put up because even if it's legal to say it might not be the most prudent to say when it comes to your reputation and your career and the artwork that you're doing right because people associate everything and the internet doesn't forget, it's like an elephant, forever. right? It's the memory forever. There used to be a time where we could reinvent ourselves. You can't do that anymore, right? Kids in college, they always do stupid gags or whatever, and it was forgotten, and they went off and they became bankers and whatever. <laughs> Not anymore. I mean, now everything is there, and everything stays there. And so it's like we have to teach as part of our skills in building our career and our brands, right? Because brand is very important for us in the artistic community because that's all we have. Our brand is our reputation. It's the way that people identify us. We want to be careful about that, okay? 
Another thing that you can't do with freedom of speech is you can't defame somebody. Right? You hear people talk about libel and slander and defamation of character. Mm -hmm. You know, this comes up in memoirs and in certain documentaries, right? How are you portraying me? Do I like the way I'm being portrayed? There's been a lot of projects that sort of the subject, once they sort of see how it all fits together, they're like, wait a minute, that's not me. That's I don't like that portrayal of me. It may actually be them, but they don't like the way they're portrayed. And so there could be problems later on trying to get that film released because they might not like it so much that, that even though you have a right contract in place that says you have the right to tell the story and you have the creative control to edit that story, they might still sue you <laughs> just to hold it up. Just because, you know, people sue because they feel they've been wrong. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily because they have a good case, right? There's a lot of cases that go that you scratch your head and say, boy, that doesn't make sense, right? Um, and the other restriction on speech comes in through our copyrights. You cannot copy somebody else's work, right? And that's a restriction on the freedom of speech. We have copyright protection, we have trademark protection, so that also restricts this idea of freedom of speech. And then people will come up and say, well, what about like what Saturday Night Live does, right? I mean, how can they get away with them, you know, Alec Baldwin being the president and uh, Kate and them being Clinton and then doing uh, Kellyanne Kelly. How can they get through that? And while we have an exception in copyright, which is fair use, and one of those, and fair use is not that it makes it right, it just says there's no harm, okay? And one of them is what we call parody, and parody is protected free speech, and parody means that you're making fun of the original. So what Alec Baldwin does is making fun of Trump, and we know that it's supposed to be Trump. There's no guessing, right? But this is different from satire, because satire is not protected under freedom of speech. And satire means we make fun of something else using this. So a good example of that is when politicians use music from a musician, but don't use the words. They change the lyrics, right? And so John McCain got in trouble with this in his campaign, where he took the music and changed the lyrics to make fun of his opponent and he got zinged, right? So he wasn't making fun of the song itself, he was making fun of somebody else using the song and that was considered no good, okay? But this issue also comes up in the visual arts. There could be a parody in art in the way something is presented and it's protected, right? And you see things that people want to censor so, you know, I come from New York, and before I came to Georgia, there was a real big issue with Rudy Giuliani, who was the mayor, and that was that the Brooklyn Museum of Art um, had an exhibit, and one artist had made a picture of the Virgin Mary, and they had used elephant gun on the picture. And Rudy Giuliani came out and said, that's not permissible, and he cut their funding. He cut their funding, right? And they came back and they sued and it was discovered, you know, that's freedom of speech and he can't censor that. And he definitely can't cut funding for that, right? Now the law doesn't decide if something's good or bad. It's not an art critic, it's not a film critic. It just decides whether it is free speech or not. Um, and so they said, no, you know, you may not like it. You might think it's in bad taste. You might think it's disrespectful, but you can't censor that. Okay, so that's some of the ways that they come out. Book bannings falls under this as well, right? So there is a, a book ban day, actually, that the libraries used to celebrate. Um, it depends on what state you're in. <laughs> Because book banning is one of those things that depends on a community standard, right?
right? Certain schools will ban some books because of who's in their community, not necessarily because nationwide they think they should ban it. What would be banned in New York is very different from what would be banned in Georgia, right? Um, but some people say no books should be banned, and other people say, no, we have a right to protect what we read, you know? Um, it comes up in games. We had a case a few years ago uh, where it was decided that violence in games was actually free speech. Mm -hmm. And so a state didn't have a right to ban the sale of it, you know? And it, that, was that, in that was a nationwide, okay. that was a federal case. And this was a big thing when this decision came through. This was really big, right? Because we had all of these watchdog organizations coming out and saying, but you know, violence in games means violence in the schools and the kids learn this. And you know, but they said, you know, one, that the, the industry, the gaming industry started self-regulating themselves, right? They started putting like the R ratings and things and they said, you know, parents also have to take some responsibility. I mean, if you've got, you know, a nine-year-old kid, should you buy that thing that says R on it? Yeah, there has to be some of that personal accountability there. Okay, so that's just an example of how it has been shoved. The next one is the freedom of the press, right? So when we think of press, it's interesting because how do you define the press? And that is a question that has really changed with social media platforms, right? Where we have what's called citizen journalism, okay? And this has been in a debate for a few years. Is it really journalism or is it just being a witness that recorded, right? What was a journalist supposed to do? A journalist is supposed to gather the facts, investigate, analyze, give the narrative but now it seems that all we're getting is the direct stuff, the raw material. There's no analysis to it. Um, and so what does that mean? Are they a journalist? And we had a case where a news blogger, they were not a journalist for any particular newspaper, but they got fined uh, 2.5 million for defaming uh, an elected official. By commenting on what they By saw? commenting on their blog. Mm -hmm. And they lost that case. Mm -hmm. They lost that case. So, you know, when we think about, oh, I can say anything I want to say, sometimes it might depend on what position you are. Mm -hmm. What are your credentials, right? Most journalists, when they work for a newspaper, they will have what? A, a media, a press credential to let you know that they're media, okay? So it's to show you how that sort of uh, works its way, but things are changing. Will these citizen journalists be accepted as journalists? Um, some of the journalists don't want them accepted, right? Because <laughs> they've worked hard, they've gone to school, they've had to go through this, okay? So um, getting their job done, we're having a lot of uh, concerns about that area of whether the press can do what they need to do with I, this new news. Mm, I think that Facebook Live also created more citizen journalists than mm -hmm. there were before, and especially the raw footage kind of without editorial comment. Yeah. Uh, I also wonder about copyright infringement when you're recording things, because if I were to upload a video on YouTube and I were to wear a shirt with like a logo on it or something like that, I would get flagged for copyright um, in my trademark. video, yeah, or trademark in mm -hmm. my in my video, and if there were music playing in the background, you know, then I could also get in trouble. And if I'm recording on Facebook Live and there's music playing, we had um, this conversation uh, because I record meetings like this, mm -hmm. and we were at uh, Santa Flax and the music's playing in the background, and I'm thinking, well, is this okay because it's so um, blurred out in here and maybe you can't barely tell because YouTube's really quick about saying, we just caught you know, 12 right. seconds of this song in your, your video. And um, I'm not 100% clear. Like if somebody drives by playing music, like if I'm sitting there outside having a conversation and a car pulls up playing Beyonce, 
<laughs> do, do we all have to stop talking and go, hey, <laughs> yes. someone's playing something. We're gonna <laughs> Unfortunately, the answer is yes. You have to stop. And, you know, this costs documentarians and people who do reality TV shows a lot of money. And it's one of the reasons why those, while they say, let's check your ring tones on your phone, because even a ringtone can cost them money that has to be licensed. Um, you know, the singing of happy birthday <laughs> was a big deal. And so if you go to some restaurants, they don't sing, you know, da 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 They all sing happy birthday to you, <laughs> happy birthday to you. You know, they'll change it in some way so that it's not that song, right? Because it was protected. And, you know, there were some times where they could be the most expensive lessons <laughs> that you had to pay. Um, but it is, you know, we do have a case that happened on YouTube. It's the Dancing Baby Yuki case <laughs> you might have heard of. It was a mother, and the song was Prince's Purple Rain, I think it was. I know it's a Prince song. Yeah, I can't remember. Song. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there's this video, and it's the baby dancing. I mean, and if you look at the video and listen to it, it's very hard to hear the music. I mean, it's not like, and uh, she was dinged and then sued by Prince. Mm -hmm. And it went to court and the court decided that it was de minimis use. And de minimis use means that it's so small, it's so slight that it doesn't really make a difference to Prince. I mean, nobody is looking at that video to hear Prince's song they're looking at the video to see the baby dance, <laughs> right? Um, was she making money off that video, and did that factor in? No, she was not making money, but that is a factor mm -hmm. when they try to look at fair use of something, right? One of the factors is, are you using it for commercial use, right? Because if you're making money, then that could affect Prince, although I couldn't imagine that people are really buying, would buy that video for the Prince song. And also looking at whether or not it was a missed licensing opportunity for Prince. Yeah. So had it been, had the song been louder and featured and gotten a lot of hits, that might have risen more to the level of him wanting to license it instead of letting it just go as a fair use. But it also brings to mind who's the individual. Prince was somebody who kept very tight control over his art, right? He had seen the lessons of the Beatles losing their catalog of songs. And right now, Paul McCartney is suing Sony to try to get those rights back. You know, Michael Jackson owned quite a bit of those songs, okay? Um, and, you know, for an artist, it's very hard for somebody else to own your work, right? And so they want that. But Prince was very, very strict about the use. And so doing the lawsuit was really in line with who he was and how he protects his art. And there's not everybody's gonna do that. I mean, some people can see a win-win, like what Julie said, hey, the more things, you know, I can put an ad on there and make a couple cents here and there, but a couple million views, I got a little bit of money, <laughs> right? Or people saying, oh, I like that song, I need to go download it, and I have it. Right, <laughs> a reminder. Um, so you know, there, there is kind of, we have to get this balance between the protection of rights and some business opportunities that might be out there that we just haven't discovered yet, right? Um, so the next one is the right of people to peacefully assemble, right? And by that we mean we can protest, we can get together, we can talk to each other, right? We can meet on the street now, there are times where a city might put in a curfew, right? Because mm -hmm. there's a natural disaster or there's some civil unrest and they're trying to protect the safety of everybody, right? Um, so there are times where they can tell us, no, we can't meet <laughs> out on the street. We can meet in our homes, we can come over, we can, you know, talk there, but they don't want people assembling in the street if there's a high tension, right? And that's very rare when the government really institutes something like that. Um, they can set restrictions. So think again of those marches, everybody needed what? A permit. They needed to file paperwork. 
right? They needed to let them know this is the route that we're bringing. Uh, and they need to pay a fee sometimes. Think of that march, all those people, what it costs for the police, what it costs to put up certain barricades, what it costs to close a street, right? So there's that balance between people exercising their rights to protest, and also what is it costing that city to host that, <laughs> right? And how can we offset that a little bit, okay? But we do have that right to get together, and it connects with the last right, which is we have a right to tell the government that they're not doing the job, that we have a complaint against them, that we have a grievance. And I think Michael Moore and his films is probably the one who's most vocal right now with what he's doing about that. Now, yes, he's focused very much on one individual in the government, but that, you know, it's the idea, he's also done films of other, right, of the parties themselves, not just of that one individual. But we have a right to call, right? Unfortunately, the White House number is now disconnected. It's not taking any calls. And they're sending people to send in your complaint through Facebook Messenger. So here's the problem with that. Not everybody has access to the internet. technology, right? Yeah. You just said it. Not everybody knows Messenger. Mm -hmm. I don't use Messenger on my phone. Well, like they can turn your video. Right? I you use Messenger camera. only on my laptop. So I will usually tell people, look, don't message me because I won't get it. Yeah. Right? Send me a text. But there is a great bit of people who don't have access to technology, and now you've just marginalized them even more. And that's a problem, isn't it? Because if your job, if our right is that we can tell government that we're unhappy, you just took that right away from lots of people because you've eliminated their access, right? And that's when the arts come into play. Because one of the roles that artists have always played is the role of advocate for certain causes, right? And we saw that this weekend with the artists seeing those signs and those stories and the way that they were telling those, those images in that way. And so we need artists more than ever now to write their songs, do their films, you know, do their animation pieces, um, you know, just do what you do. <laughs> Help raise money to pay the White House phone bills. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there are benefits, you know, there are concert benefits that are going on for ACLU and for other things. Again, people are giving what they can of themselves. What's their skill? Art. What's their art? Right? We have to be careful about asking people to do more than what they can. Yeah. Right? But we, but to tell them, sing your songs, do your music, you know, create your art, we have to make sure that they can continue to do that, that people don't feel threatened. Right? That people don't um, get sort of this fear that now I have to be silent because if I say something, and we've seen uh, some of that even in, in television where certain shows that were going to be aired have been what? Postponed. <laughs> or they never go on the air now. Certain shows that get canceled, certain shows that then get green-lighted. Okay, there was, I think it was CSI that had an episode right before the elections that had sort of a, a Trump character Right, and uh, then the election happened, and then they said, we're postponing this episode, and that episode has gone away, <laughs> right? Um, and some people would say, well, isn't that censorship? Is, is, should that be allowed? Or, you know, should people be scared? Are we, are we going to go back to the time where people are really silenced about this? And I uh, saw some hope in the last few days I don't know if you've seen the National Park Service. Yep. Has, I'm interested. It has, <laughs> has protested. <laughs> they resisted. The, uh, there was a memo that was leaked to the press that there was a gag order on many of the federal agencies not to talk to the press, not to talk to scientists. Um, and somebody from the National Park Service, and, and the social media accounts were closed, somebody from the National Park Service went and created a rogue account. There's two now? It was the Badlands and it was the Golden Gate Bridge. Oh, no. And they put
about, and what they were putting out was information about climate change, wow. right, which the new administration is against, mm -hmm. uh, stating that it's real. But they went rogue. <laughs> <laughs> they basically went rogue, but they were trying to protect each other by making it in a, an anonymous way and various people uh, linking, but they went rogue. <laughs> and mm -hmm. They said, we have uh, freedom of speech. You can't close this as a personal account. You can't get us. <laughs> Right? Um, so to see that they took that step, that's a major step, isn't that? For a federal employee um, to do that. Um, so you know, that the ACLU is saying, we're there, we'll protect them. <laughs> um, and that's what you know, organizations like ACLU are there to try to do, is to protect these folks, yeah. right? Um, and and, and when that brings me to another point, is if you can only contact the federal government through Messenger, Bacon County, does, does that mean that they can access your Facebook information? Interesting question, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you, have to, you have to friend the government before you <laughs> them. Oh, well, you don't have to friend them. <laughs> um, no. Um, now, granted, there's no messenger account. Right? People have tried to find this message. It does not exist. Mm -hmm. um, oh, you mean the White House doesn't actually have one? It's like <laughs> messenger. Uh, this is so Kafka. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, um, it's not there. And so, I mean, you can call the senator's offices and you can call Congress, but you cannot call the White House at this point, you know? And so it is. Uh, is that a violation of the Constitution? If, <laughs> if, if, you know, lawyers find a test case to bring it to court, it could be seen, right? And that's sometimes. What ACLU does is try to find a test case to bring it to the forefront. Now, it doesn't mean that these cases will be successful, but it does mean that people are fighting, that there's a resistance. The other thing I saw this morning is Greenpeace actually unfurled a flag that said resist on the crane beside the White House. Uh, and they videotaped them doing it. <laughs> And so you can see this videotape of what they're doing and the White House administration, nobody, nobody was there. Mm -hmm. Outside their own door. Uh -huh. You know, um, they took it down quickly. <laughs> <laughs> but it was on this train and it was just fascinating to watch these people doing it. I'm like saying, well, don't they have security? I mean, like, isn't somebody watching? Or is it that security was like, who cares? <laughs> Let them do it, yeah. you know? But that's, but that's also the right as long as it doesn't it's not dangerous, they're yeah. not breaking any laws. Well, are they trespassing? It was far enough back, so mm -hmm. it wasn't. I think right. just barely. Just yeah. barely. Yeah. But, you know, then those issues come up. Is it trespassing? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to be here. If you notice, the marches and these protests happen in a very specific area, don't they? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is right. Trump's Twitter account still active? It is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very so, so the counter argument to not being able to reach the White House is that you can just tweet him. But still an but again, but I, I'm just thinking, like, if we were to bring a legal claim right. against them, is, the, the response is you still have access to the you look at the percentage of people who have Twitter, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. But, but he's still likely to respond if you were oh. if you're a celebrity. <laughs> no, he's, he's responded to non celebrities. Yeah. Yeah. Just go on Saturday night. I don't respond. <laughs> <laughs> Tamika Grooms is watching on uh, Facebook. Awesome. And she said that Lee Daniels said he was excited about. So he is a producer. Yeah. He is 12 He did the butler. Oh, okay. He did the butler. So thank you, Tamika. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that's true. It's an opportunity, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. As long as people don't get scared and say, I'm not going to do this, right? Now, there are plenty of attorneys who have sort of come out and said, well, if you get in trouble, we're going to defend you, right? Attorneys who, who believe that this right has to be protected. And so what we want to do with this series is, first of all, give people knowledge. What does it mean? Give people tools. What's out there that you can use to protect yourself? And be able to answer questions and, and have you know, some experts come in and talk more about these things as it relates to the creative community, right? Our focus is the creative community. And sometimes when you have these constitutional rights discussions, it's more about civic 
advocacy, not necessarily what happens when we make a film, what happens when we make visual art, what's our protection. And so, you know, I want to open this up now to you guys uh, to see if, what are some questions that you guys might have that you would like to explore during this series? Yes. So <laughs> I'm concerned about illustrations. When you're doing like a comic series, one way to really um, beef up your audience and also um, establish your voice is to speak to current events. And when you're doing that, how do you avoid defaming someone if you're avidly against what's happening or um, how do you avoid any kind of infringements when you are showcasing things that are in the likeness of a person or something that they're doing? And that also goes for um, merchandise as well, because a lot of artists, they sell their comics, um, and they also make caricatures that they sculpt into whatever form they want to sell. Yeah, I don't know if you saw, but during the campaign, um, we ended up going to Washington, D.C., and all the shops were selling bobbleheads of uh, Clinton <laughs> And Trump, <laughs> you know, um, I doubt that Clinton and Trump got a cent <laughs> of that. And part of it is this political party, right, uh, description of what yeah. they're doing. It's a joke, mm -hmm. right? It's a joke making fun of the original again, right? Not making fun of something else, but making fun of the original. And we see this a lot with political cartoonists. Right, because their work is specifically to make a social commentary. And that is protected free speech. Social commentary is protected free speech. Um, and so it's interesting, because I gotta tell you, sometimes those illustrations can say a whole world of things in that one little panel. And it's just like, and I've, I've started collecting them because some of them are just great. <laughs> you know, they're just really, really good. And you're like, how clever that they could come up with that. And we laugh because it's a non-threatening way of doing it, right? Mm -hmm. And they play a really important role because they bring up the issue in a way that's accessible to people, right? Animation is accessible to people. Illustration is accessible to people. You don't need to know how to read to understand what's in that picture, right? So it's a much more what? Democratic <laughs> <laughs> medium, or right? Or national. I mean, if you think of why were there stained glass windows in these cathedrals in the Renaissance, it's because most people couldn't read. But they can look at the windows and understand what the stories of the Bible were, okay? And that, to some extent, is what illustrators do too. They have amazing power, don't they? And that right has to be protected. When it comes to um, monetizing on that, do you run into issues? Now that's a different thing, mm -hmm. right? Because now we're talking about what? Commerce. We're not talking about social commentary, okay? And then, that's the point where we, we might run into problems if it's too much like the original mm -hmm. <laughs> in that. And so you have to be careful. Now, under the law, unfortunately, everything is based on certain facts, right? So every case is different based on its particular facts. And, and our friend is best. <laughs> <laughs> No alternative. <laughs> <laughs> but it does bring up something because facts are not protected under copyright law. Anybody can use facts. Mm -hmm. And that's why a lot of documentaries are based on facts of something that occurred. There have been stories and, and movies made from people who researched newspaper clippings who never interviewed a single person, right? But where did they bring it from? Facts, okay? And facts mean that there's no alternative to them. <laughs> that it is what it is. That's the definition of a fact. 
So saying, therefore, nobody can then argue with you that it's wrong or that you can't use it because it's a fact. Mm. And that's not protected under copyright, so everybody can use a fact. So I will give you a fact right now. <laughs> Your maps, remember the old maps that we used <laughs> Maps are considered full of facts, right? A geographic location, the line, the strip, that's a fact, right? But if all you have are facts, and facts are not copyrighted, you couldn't copyright your maps or your books. So every single map that has been printed has an error in it somewhere. And that makes it copyrightable, that one error. So there is a dead end somewhere <laughs> or a turn on a road, right? But that's what made it copyrightable. It had to have an error because everything else was a fact. This explains so much. Uh, does it? Does it lose your way on your GPS? Yes. <laughs> right? Could a misspelling? It could be a misspelling. Oh. Right? But it has to be intentionally something wrong. You uh, mentioned the likeness um, having a lot to do with whether you could um, turn something that was originally social commentary into commerce. And uh, something that's popular to do is to make art in your own style, like whether it's a TV version or some hyper-realistic version of characters you love. Does that fall under the same thing because it's a style, but you can still easily identify that this is a character? So one of the things that get talked a lot about uh, is fan fiction <laughs> and fan films. Right? And we had a very interesting case with Twitter. I don't know how many of you remember Mad Men. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I got to watch it like a marathon. It was one of those things you just watch hour after hour after hour. Um, six o'clock in the morning on Sunday. <laughs> uh, but people fell in love with those characters. And all of a sudden, a Don Draper Twitter account showed up. And, uh, oh, her name was Olsen. Peggy, oh, Peggy, Peggy Olsen, Olsen. Mm -hmm. showed up. Mm -hmm. And Sterling showed up. And it wasn't done by AMC, which was the television. It was done by fans. Uh -huh. And they were tweeting as their character. Well, AME, of course, has trademark protection in those characters and came down really hard on them and told Twitter, you have to cancel those accounts. It was this trademark violation this, that, and that, and people rose up and said, wait a minute, you know, you should be embracing this. These are fans, right, who are coming to be part of it. Well, they ended up actually coming up with a compromise. And their compromise was they licensed for free to the Twitter people so that they can keep tweeting. But they gave them a free license. So they protected their trademarks by saying, hey, we just didn't let them do it. They have a license, mm -hmm. okay. We had a case that just got settled about a fan film, Star Trek. Okay, now you wanna talk about fans, oh, Trekkies, wow. and, you know? Um, and there have been many fan films about Star Trek. The difference was that this one was production quality. Mm -hmm. This one could actually be competition to the authorized one, and, and it got settled at a court and the, the film was dead. It got wow. settled out of court. But you can see how different that was. Production quality means there's money in it, there's actors in it, there's a, you know, they were gonna do a big marketing thing. Very, very different from just, you know, a fan film of us with our phone and me with pointy ears, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, but that happens also when you do your artwork. So for example, uh, and, and this came up in one of our meetings, Dan, the idea of, well, what if you're in a preschool, right, a day school, and they want you to paint Mickey Mouse and the Disney characters on the wall? Can you do that? No. You need a license to do that. And in fact, they actually sell the cutouts in Home Depot and you can just put it up there. But an, a painter can't do that, okay? And we often talk about students in our you know, SCAD or art schools, and they do do exact drawings of these characters, and as long as it's in their portfolio while they're a student, it's fine, right? Because what they're doing is showing their skill. 
but they can't put that on a piece of paper frame it and sell it. Snoopy is owned by somebody, okay? Unfortunately, Betty Boop is not. She is now in the public domain. So anybody can use Betty Boop, okay? Poor Betty. Poor Betty. <laughs> you know, and the fact is that Marilyn Monroe is now in the public domain as well. So people can create with Marilyn Monroe and poor Marilyn. Maybe it's a woman. Uh -huh. You know, Frank Sinatra protected his rights. Uh -huh. um, but, and that, that Marilyn Monroe and Frank Sinatra are what we call publicity rights. And depending on the state you lived in when you died, those rights can continue after death. Frank Sinatra lived in New Jersey. Uh, Marilyn Monroe lived in New York, and in New York, that doesn't continue after death. Mm. Okay, so for some artists, you might want to make sure you're dying in the right state <laughs> or that your license has the right state so that your your publicity rights continue, right? But if not, then people can use your persona. Mm -hmm. Marilyn Monroe is everywhere, isn't she? Mm -hmm. Snickers commercial. Snickers yeah. commercial, yeah. yeah. They're doing, you know, and it's interesting the way technology comes in because now with virtual reality and holograms, you know, we've had concerts with Tupac, who's been dead for a number of years, and that is becoming more and more, Just right? And, so long. Yeah, <laughs> and is there a licensing fee for that? What are the rights? Do they have rights as an avatar? You know, we have the EU, if you think this is funny, the EU in the past two weeks has been discussing whether robots deserve their own rights wow. as artificial people. Uh, hello? <laughs> Okay, that's scary. Everybody in this room just went. <gasps> <laughs> Robot versus camera. Uh -huh. And I don't know if you guys <laughs> remember. If you, well, the question becomes, we have robots that are creating art. There was a film called Morgan, and an AI program created the trailer for that movie. Who owns the copyright to the trailer? Um, whoever owns Robot? Hmm, it's interesting, Did right? Did they have because to tell the robot to make it, right? Well, they gave them... The robot didn't do it on its own. It so they gave them certain instructions, and then instruct don't. But if, if it comes to the point where a robot or artificial intelligence is considered an artificial entity, then how do they get copyrights, right? We had, I don't know how many of you remember the monkey selfie. Mm -hmm. Okay, this guy was out in the jungle. There was this monkey... The monkey took the camera, took a selfie, and you know, went all over the internet. And the photographer started suing people, saying, no, no, it belongs to me. And they said, no, who shot it was the monkey. <laughs> and PETA, P-E-T-A, actually sued on behalf of the monkey. <laughs> and the court said, it doesn't belong to the photographer, because he didn't take it. But it doesn't belong to the monkey either, because the monkey isn't human. intelligence. Mm -hmm. These are things that are happening, you know, VR programs where you're now immersed in that and you change what's happening around you. Who owns that copyright when you change that program from inside? These are things that we're going to have to grapple with. Mm -hmm. And where the line is because like you said, who gave the computer the work and who did any kind of input, and then where's the, line with, yeah, <laughs> where's the line between someone using Photoshop and using those brushes, or using the, the capabilities of a program? Yeah. You know, a program is also helping out there, it's just less than what the right. AI is doing. Great. Bachi and Richardson says, hello, another Hi. artist. And then Tamika Brooms comes back, she says, robots don't have rights. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, Tamika. That's it's it. just it. <laughs> robots are robots, and uh, humans are humans, we, and robots don't have rights. We have a robotic teacher <laughs> at Tech that's teaching a music class, and it's all online, but it's creating music, and no one can tell that it's a robot at this okay. point. So we're getting scary close to that line. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so does that, so does that so robotic that. robot hmm. or Somebody AI that. And do you have the rights, or does the creator of that? Robot well, or right anything. now, most people will say, who codes? Who does the code? Yeah. They own the right. But what happens when we get to the point where the robot codes the robot? Wow. Or it's um, 
so much um, commerce going on. Like if I purchase this robot, same way I would purchase a program, I own the rights when I purchase a program. Um, when I purchase this robot, then if it goes back to the color, I'll be very upset. <laughs> Well, you know, this technology changes things, doesn't it? And it continues to evolve and change, and so we don't know where it's going to end up. You know, drones, for example, so many um, motion pictures and films now are using that drone footage, right? So much so that the FCC has to <coughs> sort of accept that now there's this industry that uses it. And so it had to create guidelines, understanding that there are some commercial uses for it, that it's not just for recreation or hobby, right? And so, but does that mean that that person has to have a pilot license now? And are they regulated by the FAA? Right now they are, and they have to have that pilot license, okay? But I mean, we have a whole film festival, New York City Drone Film Festival. <laughs> Look them up on Facebook and online. They're awesome footage, amazing footage that you can't get any other way. But you know, they are really, what, bleeding edge of these rights that are coming in. So I think there's a lot that happens with that. 3D printing is another one, mm. right? What's gonna happen when we start 3D printing everything that we need? Do we then just buy a license for the blueprint, mm -hmm. right? The blueprint of the phone. I buy the license for the blueprint of the phone, set my printer, it prints my phone, I'm good to go. Right now that's to do with a lot of models. Mm -hmm. Like if I wanted to buy um, pieces for uh, maybe a set I was doing, I would have to buy the pattern from them. But what is um, shaky is similar to like buying any kind of merchandise. You don't know if they have licenses to give it to you. Mm -hmm. And you could be getting these patterns or um, yep. these blueprints, and it, it's not something that's like fully licensed. Yep. So good questions. Other Plus questions. You're getting getting that from a country that doesn't really respect. Yes. That. And international. And that's the other problem is that copyrights and trademarks. You know, these are not global. Freedom of press and freedom of speech are not global. We're talking about what happens here in the US and we have to be careful when we travel to other countries that we're not saying, wait a minute, I'm an American, I've got free speech. You might not have it in the country that you're going to. <laughs> and you have to understand that, right? And you have to respect their laws and their culture the way that they would respect ours when they come here, you know? Good questions. You got some more? <laughs> I do okay. have more questions, okay. but I'll eat them all up. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. okay. so, um, we, we do a show that goes on national color television about the environment. Um, and uh, so there was a situation, and I'm thinking about the current administration and their position on the environment, and mm -hmm. I'm going to be running into more of this. There was a situation where our, our program is funded by a nonprofit. It's available for free download to anyone. Um, when uh, we did a show about GMOs, um, we ran into some resistance from a certain uh, state public broadcasting system that complained to us that we did not have a fair and balanced uh, position on that. And our argument was our show is clearly about the environment. Mm -hmm. Our concerns are about the environment. The companies that make these GMOs put out their alternative facts. <laughs> they, they put out they're, um, they, you know, basically it, it was like, it is not incumbent on us to have both sides equally represented because the other side is already well funded ah, right. and their information is everywhere. Mm -hmm. What we were saying was not that GMOs are, made, we weren't saying they, were, they made you sick or they made you die or anything like that. What we talked about was their impact on the environment. Mm -hmm. so there's they require a lot of pesticides and herbicides, and therefore, they, it's a scientific mm -hmm. fact that it's killing organisms in the soil that you actually need to have good soil. So that was one of the things, but we, they did end up airing it, but the complaint, I felt like I had to argue back. So I guess the question really is, I mean, as a documentary, mm -hmm. we did documentary style shows, um, 
we are allowed to have a point of view as long mm -hmm. as we stick with, you know, and we interview people who have points of view and they may present some facts and they may also say, I feel like I wouldn't give rumors to my children right. based on what I know. And that's all okay, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, and mm -hmm. you know, I think you bring up a, a couple points. First of all, it's public broadcasting, right? For as long PBS. as we have it. it for as long <laughs> as we have it. <laughs> Um, which is a sad statement <laughs> in and of itself. But, it, you know, when people think of public broadcasting, say when they think of public radio, they have a certain thing in mind, right? That this is going to be objective, unbiased, that it's going to be the truth, that, you know, it, it's held to a higher standard than just broadcast. And one of the reasons why we have public broadcasting system is well, so we that, we shall we turn this off? <laughs> 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 Inside joke, you missed it. Uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> um, but it, you know, it's held to a higher standard because it's considered that the public is paying for it, and it is in the public interest to have the truth. And that if we did not have public broadcasting and public radio, we would not get the truth, yeah. right? Because everything else is based on entertainment, based on ratings, and so there is a real public service aspect to these things, okay? But then you have, it, you know, it's a catch-22 in some ways because again, public broadcasting, if you look at the different stations, if you want to do this kind of research, and you look at where they air, what you will notice is that even on these public stations, they'll have different kinds of shows. So PBS in New York will do different shows than PBS in Kentucky. Right? Because, it, again, it's a community kind of tool. And so out of 50 states, one came and complained to me, right? But the others were like, okay. And what you said was very true. On the for-profit side, they've got a lot of resources to get their story told. Right? And I think this is one of the reasons why we value people who do documentaries so much. Because... They're always underfunded. They're, there's nobody ever has enough money to tell these kinds of stories. And so they become sort of this passion project, this labor of love, this true mission to get this out and get people aware. You know, when you listen to Michael Moore now, I mean, he's on a mission. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and so you have to respect them for that commitment that they give to it. Because there is a lot of pressure of, is this what our community can accept? Right? The truth sometimes is really difficult to swallow. And people resist. And when, you know, part, for example, censorship, book banning, those are all ways of resisting certain truths that people do not want to hear. Right? So I think that's a great question. Because we do have to realize that there's this public broadcasting and then there's all the other media that has a very different purpose, right? And courts do look at that, right? Because public broadcasting is not about making money, but the rest of entertainment is. But what when those things get mixed? What about HBO? HBO is a big proponent of documentaries. I mean, they, you know, you go to premium channels, HBO has documentary films, documentary shorts. I mean, they've got special things. They're doing it for the money, right? I mean, it's a paid service. Mm -hmm. Does that change the value of that story? Were those stories done in a certain way to match that need of that particular channel? Or are they doing it for money, or is it part of their corporate um, value system? that some of their more profitable shows also, also find as documentaries. Wow. It, there's, you didn't think about these things before, did you, Dan? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's too much. Too now. much. It's too much. Uh -huh. that, that's a great question because lots of times people, especially with documentaries, I think it's such a minefield, right? Can I say something about somebody 
And, and there is a difference between public figures and a private individual. Mm, well, that's starting to blur. Like one of my friends who is a voice actress, uh, she was on Twitter just voicing her opinion as she normally does. And someone wrote in that she shouldn't be able to say this because she's a public figure now. Mm. And she just got picked up with Dragon Ball Z. So, I mean, what if, when do you say that this is the job that separates me from the, the people? It's interesting because that, that question has come up a lot with social media. I mean, if you're somebody, nobody ever knew you, but you've got a million Twitter followers. Are you now a public persona? No, it's not. Mm. There's that, even though you know most people don't know you, but you've got those followers. And the other interesting thing about Twitter is just because I follow you doesn't mean that I'm reading everything you tweet, okay. right? So a lot of followers don't even pay attention, right? Every once in a while, you'll look at something and pick something out, but they don't even pay attention. But does that make you that public persona? And, and why is that important? Because under the law, you're held to a higher standard. It's more difficult for you to win a case against somebody for defamation, that they said something wrong about you, right? Because if you are a public person, then you have to prove malicious intent. You have to prove that that person not only knew that it was false, but that they did it intentionally to harm you. That's a high standard. You know, and the other thing is courts say, hey, you put yourself out there. You know, you get all the rewards of being a celebrity, of being an elected official, so deal with it, right? Deal with the downfall. Will that change? You know, it's one of the concerns that we have. Will that standard come down now? Where a celebrity is just considered another person and then we don't have that malicious intent standard be a lot more lawsuits. Mm -hmm. So my test for a celebrity used to be that they had an IMDb page. Uh, that was a good indicator. Oh, that's that's that that would be not a celebrity. Yeah, that would be not a celebrity. Okay. 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 <laughs> I mean, that's Incorrect. That's my job. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's a question about, you know, Twitter has that program of verified. And people are saying, well, if you're verified by Twitter, okay. you're a public person. And reporters are verified to have 3,000 followers. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's, um, uh, what do you call them, fitness instructors. I yeah. used to follow a fitness instructor. I remember when he got verified. He didn't become a celebrity until a few years later, but still. Mm -hmm. But sometimes people will use that because Twitter has a criteria yeah. before they say you can be verified. Um, if you have a page in Wikipedia, are you now a public person? Because there have been people who have actually been denied a Wikipedia page. It seems odd to put that on some private company or some or some uh, charity in Wikipedia's yeah. case to make that yeah. kind of decision. It's concerning that there isn't a clear measure. It used to be a lot easier. <laughs> on in social media um, and people were saying you know this isn't a true number I mean you can game the system right you just mm -hmm. keep tweeting and you game the system mm -hmm. and I remember Papers and more followers well, yeah <laughs> cloud, 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 cloud is the other one Maybe. and um, and I actually read the book by the guy who created cloud and one of the things that he claimed was that cloud was going to become so such a credible measure of people that people would be hired depending on their clout scores. Well, you know, in the beginning, I always like to check things out. I mean, I gotta know, right? My clients, are, I wanna know what it's about. And when I looked, I was influential on pizza and zombies. 
Mm. Now, I love The Walking Dead, but this was before The Walking Dead. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I guess I must have ordered a lot of pizza because my girls were teenagers at that time. Uh -huh. And they must have seen Papa John's or something, you know, but I couldn't understand pizza, you know, zombie. What's going on? But <laughs> just to show you what gets tracked. Wow. Um, I can remember when Google was saying they can, you know, based on your uh, queries, they can determine who you were. And I tried that out and I was, um, this must have been like five years ago. I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but significantly older than what they said. According to them, I was a 33-year-old male who liked basketball. Wow. <laughs> and how did you look that up? Uh, there was something, I can't even remember it now, this was five years ago, but right. it was just fascinating to me, yeah. I, I like, it was either basketball or football. One yeah, of those. Play just to see yeah. what comes up now. Um, <laughs> but it was, just, it was just fascinating, you know? What, what, what was I, and then I would think back, what was I searching? What, that came up with this, you know, the 33 male? I mean, it was weird. It was weird to find that out. Are you a basketball fan? No. <laughs> I didn't no. think so. So I'm you know, trying I'm to like, understand but, that one. <laughs> but here's the thing. I've also set up Google alerts. This is something that you should all do. Google alert your name. Google alert your business. I Google alert my clients. I Google alert, you know, things I'm interested in. Um, and there is another Deborah Gonzalez, because Google Alerts will just bring in what they find on Deborah Gonzalez. And she is a basketball player in Mexico. There you go. Right? And so maybe that's where they picked it up. Mm. You know, because Deborah Gonzalez is a pretty common name in the Hispanic culture, right? Um, and I always joke, you know, I'm 4'10", so you can see me as a basketball player, right? <laughs> so, you know, whenever I would get the alerts, I would be like, yay, we were the champion, <laughs> yay, I'm so big. Um, <laughs> But you know, it's kind of funny that in, in one way, all this data is being collected about us and perceptions are being made about us by this. And so it's really interesting to sort of, hmm, that's what they think of me. <laughs> I'm 33 male, I like you know this sport. Maybe I'll get a job easier, I don't know, <laughs> if I put that profile mm -hmm. instead of who I am. Uh, but there's a lot to it, isn't there? Um, and that brings us to another type of freedom of speech is what's happening with our data. Right? Because one thing to know is that most of the stuff that's out there about us, we've put it there. Mm -hmm. Right? How many of you answered? Or allowed it to be taken. Or allowed uh -huh. it. So how many of you have done those quizzes? Are you Hermione Granger oh, or Harry yeah. Potter? Oh, sure. Right? What color do you like? Uh -huh. Are you this? You know, I've done that. Are you this TV lawyer or are you that TV lawyer? <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Right? Just, a, just whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but when you fill those out, you're giving a lot of information mm -hmm. about yourself, about the way you think, about the way you make decisions. And all of that is being collected and sold and used. Right? And so I think one thing... Hopefully in the aggregate instead of personally identifiable. Mm -hmm. Hopefully. But I can remember um, in 2011 being in a session and the person who was giving the session was talking about this new thing called Foursquare. And how, you know, you can go to a place and you can check in. Right now, it's sort of uh, divided into Foursquare and Swarm. It's really annoying to have the two of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but at that time... And he was giving this talk in front of the provost of a big university. So think like a vice president of a university. And he said, yeah, people can check in and then you know where they are. And the provost said, ah, and I can know where all my faculty is at any time. Ooh. Ooh, isn't that scary? <laughs> you know, there's this app now being sold on TV. I don't know if you've seen the commercial, but it's an app that the parent can put this mm -hmm. on the car so you can know mm -hmm. where the child is, how fast they're going. Wait, that's, you know, the That'll child. help with legal. Huh? That'll help with legal work. <laughs> it does help with legal, but I'm still, part of me still likes to say, but what about privacy? When can kids be kids? When can we learn to make mistakes and grow up and take some responsibility? And mm. I mean, there's just, I'm not an advocate for living life 24-7 online. Or under surveillance. Or under surveillance. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, we have that movie coming out, The Circle, with Emma Watson and Tom Hanks. The book, The Circle, is by Dave Edgars, and it talks about a Facebook-like company that basically says privacy is theft, that everything should be online, and if everything is online, mm -hmm. then there is no privacy, right? Mm -hmm. Then there's nothing to hide, everything is out there. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I think there's still some things I want to do behind closed doors. <laughs> you know, there's still some conversations that I want to have and not have to worry that everybody is going to hear it. Mm -hmm. South Park did an episode about what would happen if yeah. you could look up everybody's internet history. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you guys haven't seen, <laughs> has anybody here seen Black Mirror? I have, I've thought yes. about that a lot because there are a lot of parallels to what you were saying. Mm -hmm. There is an episode about how the people in England vote a cartoon character as prime minister. <laughs> a real animated cartoon character as prime minister. It is great. Yeah. That is an amazing Regardless. series. Regardless. <laughs> if you ever get to see Black Mirror, <laughs> Netflix has it. It is an amazing series. I haven't well, seen season two yet, but I, their stories are oh my god. Mm -hmm. Can we go home and watch it right now? Yeah. <laughs> so that's good. So we're going to um, be wrapping up because I want to make sure that everybody, you know, we stay on the timetable. But please, those of you who are watching at home, those of you who see this later on, you guys that are in Zoom, send us topics and questions. And this is what we're going to try to do is explore these issues together and figure it out, you know, how we do this for the next four years and beyond. Okay? So four years. Four years. Mm. Four. Four. <laughs> four. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my greatest fear, my greatest hope, actually, is that Google stays benevolent because, Lord, they know every single thing about us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think that's pretty much what you learned in kindergarten is, that, you know, if you stay away from name calling <laughs> or, or if, you, if you go with Michelle Obama's, you know, when they go low, we go high, um, you will be okay. You can still get your point across. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This has been really eye-opening for me because I haven't decided how to express myself about the Trump administration because I am a lawyer and I didn't want to put anything out there that would later come back to be a situation for me that I have to deal with and face even if mm -hmm. it was something that I felt strongly about. Um, so this is a, a, a nice kind of segue into maybe how I can start expressing myself safely. Uh, I have um, started my uh, daily vlogs where every day I post uh, to YouTube and I also every day work out on uh, um, Facebook. I had one issue where uh, the workout video that I do, a little bit of, of it was heard on YouTube and it got flagged and I had to write a letter to um, the person that I work out to and ask to please continue using her workout videos because I'm doing a challenge where I'm following her routine and I was glad that it was like a person to person mm -hmm. and she agreed and she's like okay you can continue using the videos and working out to them um, but it was only because I didn't show her image and because the audio was very low and it wasn't like people could use this video right. instead of hers mm -hmm. um, one thing that I took away from today that I definitely would be more cautious of is all the audio in the background. I know it's a pain when I'm at events and I wanna shoot something and I can't hit monetize on it because there are logos on people's shirts. And even in my videos, I have to go change because I'm, I'm gonna go shoot the video or I'm gonna put a jacket on backwards because I have to go shoot a video. Um, and now I have to worry about, now what do I have to do about the scenery? Do we have to move the entire set? Everyone in this crowd move over here because there's this thing here that we can't see. 
so now I'm going to um, think about what I can do in advance, like before events, maybe tell people, please wear shirts that don't have logos on it. Maybe that'll be the standard. And sometimes you can't. I mean, some, you know, films are made like the man on the street type interviews. You get what you get. Uh, and then you see that lots of things get blurred. Yeah. Yes. Which is, it's, it's time not consuming best, and expensive. But, yeah. when, one thing you can do is ask people if you knew shirt things are allowed. Mm. Oh. That's such a good Quick and easy way. Go to the bathroom. See. Turn yeah. inside yeah. out. Or at least see? the ladies, because we don't really have right. quality sure. on yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Well, great. One thing that I've learned is um, there's a lot of interest in these topics, and I think it's timely. So, And I'm glad you guys are taking this and hopefully every time we have a session maybe we can do this kind of thing where people can sort of you know log in and tell us their questions it was great to have Tamika here Tamika thank you uh -huh. always nice and the other gentleman that was here so that's good because we do have to get the message out right regardless of where we are geographically located so thank you guys for coming those of you who are not here we had good food you missed yeah. <laughs> Center for Civic Innovation, 115 MLK Junior Drive Southwest in Atlanta by the underground, okay? We're on the third floor. Um, and join us last Wednesday of the month. There's no fee as long as you RSVP early so we know how many people, so we get the right amount of food, okay? It's not about, we want to hold you to this, but it is about, you know, whether we get the food or not. So we hope you will join us. Check us out on Facebook. Uh, at Letterbox Legal and at on our website letterboxlegal.com and uh, we look forward to having you guys join us as we go forward. Okay? Thank cool. you. Thank you.